Okay, welcome everybody to the next episode of the AMR Origin Series. Um, we keep going, we keep learning, and we keep uncovering the backstory to some of the fascinating, interesting, different papers that have been published in AMR. And in this case, we've got a paper that's about the process of theorizing, particularly in the face of sort of newer te technological approaches, newer uh, perspectives and ways of doing things. And so the title of the paper is The Ghost in the Machine on Organizational Theory in the Age of Machine Learning. And the authors of this paper are Keith Levitt at Oregon State University, Kira Shabram at University of Washington, um, uh, Prashant Hariharan at Indian School of Business, and Chris Barnes at the University of Washington. Um, and so we're going to chat to them a little bit about um, what's in this paper, the backstory to the paper, um, and even some of the, the, the process of engaging in an AMR dialogue about this paper. But before we do, let's just uh, uh, meet the uh, two first authors on this paper, Keith and Kira. So if you can just give us um, where you're at, what your research identity is, and, and I guess maybe just sort of your personal connection with this paper, inspiration connection with this paper. So Keith, if we can start with you. Yeah, thanks, Greg. A uh, long-time listener, first-time caller, so excited to be here. Um, <laughs> Keith Levitt, uh, Professor of Management and Betty S. Henry Amundsen Faculty Scholar in Ethics, uh, Oregon State University. Generally, my research interests, uh, I'm a bit of a dabbler, but I usually cover spaces of, of self-categorization and identity, um, ethics, and then uh, epistemology and, and methods. So the original sort of idea here is I was, after a conversation with Kira, just talking about what does theory do for us beyond, you know, provide us sort of descriptions of predictions or things along those lines. So the social functional kind of stepping outside of theory for a minute and thinking about theorizing is just uh, something that kind of aligns with, with kind of my general research interest. I've done some stuff before on um, theory pruning and, and epistemology and how we, we think about bounding or shaping theory. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Kira, what about you? Yeah, so I'm Kira Shabram. I'm an assistant professor here at the University of Washington. I'm also the Everett McCabe Endowed Fellow in Private Enterprise. Um, broadly speaking, my research interest is in people who want to make the world a better place, often the pitfalls of people trying to do that. And then I suppose a meta approach of that has been how we as scientists try to use theory to, quote unquote, make the world a better place. Um, and I suppose what brought me into this project was number one, wanting to work with Keith. I love his theory pruning paper, if I can give another shout out. Um, and I was particularly drawn to the idea of the spectrum of theory that we cover in this paper from local and urgent pressing issues to these broad theories. Uh, yeah. So a little backstory here. Um, when I was at the University of Washington doing my PhD, we read the theory pruning paper in uh, one of Terry Mitchell's seminars, I believe. And so I was not surprised to see the word prune in the abstract of this very paper. So um, I, I did pick up on that uh, connection back. But um, we're 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 done with pruning, or we are using pruning as a as a as a segue into the ghost in the machine on organizational theory in the age of machine learning. In essence, what's this paper about? What's the sort of extended elevator pitch for this paper? Yeah, so um, I guess the, the quick and dirty on it is that machine learning tools are becoming ubiquitous. We're seeing them pop up now um, in ways that we didn't even think about them encroaching on our lives uh, as they have in the past year. But um, what's sort of fascinating is these things can now oftentimes make predictions, at least in the near term, uh, that are way more accurate than what we're doing with traditional theory and, and hypothesis building and testing. Um, so there's been some arguments, even the... Um, uh, the editor-in-chief of Wired magazine made a provocative claim that we could be living in a world free of theory uh, from the standpoint that prediction has gotten so good, we really need theory anymore. So what this paper sort of takes on, it first unpacks kind of the three most common types of machine learning models based on how they're trained. So sort of an overview of what those are, um, as well as the limitations with regard to actually producing generalizable or explainable findings using these tools. Um, from there, we map each of these onto our most common sort of modes of research or ways of knowing, which would be, you know, our deductive, abductive, and inductive theoretical approaches um, to try to identify how these tools can solve some of our current problems or the ruts we're stuck in with mid-range theory, um, specifically speaking to underspecification and sort of overaccumulation of theory and how these tools might help there. 
Um, but finally, we discuss how machine learning can help researchers move beyond mid-range theory, that place we've sort of been stuck in, and opening opportunities for hyper-local theory focused on really practical problems um, or short and extraordinary periods of time, right? So really focusing on getting um, very hyper-local, hyper-specific, and creating perishable theory that can help us solve real problems in real time. But also, we discuss how machine learning can enable theory to become grander and better serve for social functional purposes, right? Where theory can do more for us than just make predictions. And we break those down as theory is hearth, theory is zeitgeist, theory is metaphor, and theory is something that orients our moonshots. So uh, kind of at a high level, I would say those are the, the things the paper tries to accomplish. Awesome. I mean, a great uh, uh, just summary of all the little valuable aspects of this paper. And it touches on so many different things from um, you know, going back to the, the early AMR papers, uh, in essence, what is theory and how do we develop it? And then really bringing it into the modern age of many of the technological tools and perspectives and ideas, almost concepts and ideas that are available to us. How would you so, sort of, who would you, who are you writing this paper for when you're sitting back and thinking about the audience of who's going to pick this up and 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 use it? and sort of build on it, what, what do you see as the key audience in, in your mind of, of develop when you develop this paper? Yeah, so first you've mentioned how diverse our author team is, and I think I can be a little bit clearer on that diversity in that we came to this with varying degrees of expertise about machine learning. I do basically nothing. I'm being facetious, but not a lot. And so in I think one audience for this paper is people who know nothing about machine learning. I think you've mentioned we have a figure of the muffins and the chihuahuas from. It's, I think we're speaking in a language that helps people who haven't yet really embraced this tool or understand this tool or maybe even scared by the tool, what it can actually do. And that's because at least one of the authors also didn't know. So learning throughout the process. Um, that's one audience. I think the second approach we took in the writing, and we'll give a lot of credit to the reviewer team for that, is that it is written in a rather optimistic tone, and that is very much on purpose. And you'll also see that in our dialogue response, that there is a lot of work out there cautioning about some of the concerns that come with machine learning. We mentioned the Wired quote, right? Do we even still need theory? And so our goal really throughout and became stronger throughout the review process is what are, what is the potential here? How can we bring machine learning and theory together for better prediction, for better explanation? I think that's two approaches and two, two audience we'd like to target. So people who don't know anything about machine learning and want to learn and people who are excited about the potential. And the, the other audience I'll just bring in as someone who's read the paper fairly recently is really doctoral students who sort of want to understand the state of the discussion around management theory and management theorizing and where we've landed up with most of our theorizing being very much in this mid-range, which means that we land up leaving out the opportunity to do more grand theory. And you highlight that and, and specify how that might happen using machine learning approaches. But also this sort of notion of, of becoming hyper-localized and hyper-specific in our theorizing and the opportunity to do that. And I just found it, there's the, the, the figure, figure one in the paper, which really maps out the landscape of theory, whether it entails machine learning or not. Like it's like a foundational sort of diagram that can help anyone entering this field understand the role of theory. So I'll just commend you for that. And I'll, I expect to see this in, in many um, sort of foundational um, uh, doctoral seminars, just because I, th I think there's value there. Thank you. Uh, um, so, 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 talk to us. You, you, you've sort of started to allude to diversity of author team, um, to having this initial conversation between the two of you. Keith always having this interest in epistemology and also ex probably some exposure to some of this machine learning stuff, but how did the project really get some momentum behind it or, or what was the initial foray into it and then generating some momentum behind it? You know, this was very much kind of an effectuation paper, right? To step outside of OB for a second. Um, so 
for having three authors that are at the same institution, that doesn't at all describe how this project sort of came about. <laughs> um, so Chris Barnes and I are longtime kinds of friends and collaborators. I've known Kira for a while, always sort of wanted to work with her. She had recently come off of uh, giving a seminar talk here that was absolutely brilliant and enjoyed um, spending the time. So Kira and I were just largely talking about what happens when you step outside of our field a little bit, right? What happens when you sort of look at what we do and kind of the strangeness of it? but also the contours of it, how we think about theory and what that means, and sometimes the hiccups. And that's sort of a general conversation about what theory does for us, right? Does theory have these social functional values outside of, uh, you know, just drawing boxes and arrows models that we can then go test? Um, and Kira probably has one of the best sort of high-level perspectives on our field, um, especially for somebody who's an assistant professor, uh, well beyond, you know, most people I know. So there was the insight or the desire to do something around that, but kind of free of context. Um, Chris and I were probably on a mountain bike trip, and he started talking about this awesome graduate student he had, which was Prashant, who came from an engineering background and was kind of on the cutting edge of machine learning and was the sort of guy before, you know, tools like TensorFlow were there, could kind of build an algorithm, basically. So Chris was starting to understand that and wanting to pursue a project around, um, you know, theory and machine learning, starting with a review of how it's been used to date, but also just sort of, hey, what are these buckets and how how might those manifest into something? So um, we had these two kind of groups that decided we could come together and, and try to do something a little bit bigger. Um, but that initial project probably didn't look as much like, um, you know, what you actually see in front of you now, because I think it was initially kind of in defensive theory, uh, as opposed to thinking about the complementarity of it. So um, it looked nothing like it, but the origin was was literally, you know, I think we had two people talking about a potential collaboration who wanted to work together. Somebody else at her same institution who just had not kind of crossed those wires and through serendipity, we kind of said, hey, we have something we can maybe pull together here and do something unique. Yeah, I mean, I'll add to that. The, I think the gestalt of this team was that different parts of this paper we're already there in different people's heads in a way that we really learn from each other. So I will say in that first spitballing session, which I can see Chris at Keith's office right now, we were in his office. He already had the theory as metaphor and the theory as time capsule. I'm sure others at theory as moonshot, what we end up calling it, but he was just pitching that. And, and I hadn't thought about theory in that grand scale. And then I think I brought the hyper local more. So that's not to take credit, but instead to say, like, we came from these very different perspectives and ended up with the spectrum that I'm really excited about and that I don't think any of us could have done on their own. Yeah. And that just that just really speaks to the value of conversations, keeping those conversations going, being open to different perspectives. And um, I mean, the honest my, my intrigue was with the paper was I had not connected the concept of machine learning or artificial intelligence or sort of this technological um, uh, uh, revolution, if you like, that we're on with management theory in any substantive way. And so I was drawn in by the notion that 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 this appeared in AMR and it was sort of connecting the two. And so making sure that you have those conversations and keep them open i think is um is critically important what role did the the notion of the special issue play at what stage in your discussion did that come and then and 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 then what did you sort of shift or change in order to target it for that or was it just sort of perfectly fortuitous and a natural fit so i'd love to get that take because we haven't necessarily had discussions about papers that have landed up in special issues. So I've always loved that AMR every 10 years does this, right? There's something, some really cool papers that come out of that special topics forum. And it was sort of a daunting thing to, to think about, you know, send, sending something to it, but it became kind of the audacious goal as we were orienting around these things. I think Chris already had the special topics forum in mind for the machine learning piece. Um, and as Kira mentioned, there were these sort of ideas, these pieces that were floating around in my head that I thought, gosh, can I come up with something on the social functional value of theory, right? Or what it does for us on that scale. Um, so I think we were both kind of already implicitly assumed we wanted to, to target that special topics for them. Is Again, if you visit that over the decades, like there's been some pretty powerful, pretty impactful papers in there. So it was sort of an audacious goal. And, and that, I think, was our starting point was that, um, you know, this isn't the conventional AMR paper. I, I don't know that a regular issue wouldn't have had room for it, 
but it just felt like it was a good thing to target. And, and we really liked the legacy of that issue, I think, was a piece of it. Plus, you know, deadlines are motivating, too. So, <laughs> hey, Yeah, I'll just briefly add to that. So I, I will admit I had not read about half of the papers in the previous special topics forum. I just it, they'd never come across my desk and I ended up reading them all as we were working on this paper. And it became more and more of a dialogue between the prior papers. So you'll see we have a ton of citations from also the 1989 issue. So this idea that we revisit our field every 10 years, I'm, I'm really humbled that we get to be part of that conversation now. And hopefully again, 10 years, well, Keith, we should talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, can, can you talk to us a little bit about working as a team? Like, So I know three of the four authors on this team. They're highly productive individuals in their own right, sort of in each operating. I mean, Keith and, and, and Chris have done some work before, but uh, quite a lot of work before together, but the rest of you sort of operating in your own lanes. And um, what did you find? And, and and for the most part, Keith, when you've worked with Chris, it's on empirical papers, you've got data, you bounce it back and forth, you run experiments, do all of those things. But yeah, you're working on a conceptual paper, it's big ideas. Um, what did you find worked in terms of collaboration and what maybe didn't work as well? Are there any kind of specifics you can point to that sort of seem to move the needle and things that might have held you back or, 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 or didn't lead to fortuitous outcomes in terms of really pragmatic like tactics and ways of working? I tend to try to put too much into a paper. I, I live at the 30,000 foot level sometimes. And so having some people that could simply discipline that was a big piece of it and finding kind of those pragmatic hooks. And what's wonderful about working with Kira is she just always has this perspective that's just a little bit different and brings something in that we hadn't thought about. And there was always some, some pocket of knowledge that she had on research that was already out there and said, hey, what about this angle? So that ability to kind of rein things in, I think, was a big part of, you know, Chris Chris Barnes is as productive as he is, not just because he's brilliant, but he's also very pragmatic. He knows what fits in a paper. He knows how to structure a paper. And so one of the great things about working with Chris is he is able to just discipline your ideas down and, and get you back on task um, very quickly. So I would say that was a big part of, of Chris's role in particular. I mean, he is, you know, as we map things and, and work to understand the machine learning piece, Prashith was the one who really had the expertise there and was able to kind of, you know, spoon feed us into that so we could understand it well enough. So that was a, a big piece of what happened there was him having that technical expertise. And I think Keith basically sums it up. I like I, Chris is a brilliant person. I mean this as a compliment. I've worked on a lot of projects with him now. I always think of him as the brakes and me and the gas, but again, in the best way, because I will just keep driving until we run out of gas. And Chris is so great at saying, like, what is the point of this? Um, the one other thing I'll say, and I, I assume listeners can relate to this, is there's certain people whose writing just sings. Um, so Keith and I, I don't think we actually met that often, thinking back on it. We would just send the draft back and forth. And, and his writing just sings. It's been such a pleasure to write with him. <laughs> and and in some teams, that that just seems to work, where you're bouncing the draft back and forth and you sort of trust the other person, you understand sort of where the other person's coming from and why they may have said something, whereas it seems with other teams spending hours and hours on Zoom is actually valuable and talking through things. So uh, I just wanted to get a sense of that. Now, there is there is obviously quite a lot of, of almost review type work that went as a back end to this to understand how machine learning had been used across multiple disciplines in prior research projects and, and somewhat related disciplines, sociology, political science, and so on. And then you highlight sort of some of the more salient or relevant ones of those um, sort of explicitly up front in the paper, but there's this back end that's, that's been this ton of work that's gone into understanding how machine learning's been used. Um, who 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 did all that work and 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 how did that sort of factor into the the process of paper development? I, shan't. I, I mean, with our with you know meeting, your guidance and which yeah. examples we pull, but I think all credit goes to him on that. I was going to say it's worth noting too. This is one of those places where sometimes you get really lucky with an AE, 
And I think because we have an AE who's a classic org theorist, and, and when I say that, I mean in the big tent, very sort of, you know, thinking about a field as a whole, but also thinking about a field as an interdisciplinary thing where we study organizations at the center. I think had it been just the four of us, um, Kira might have overcome the impulses just to make it an OB paper more than, than the rest of us might have, but I think it might have been a bit more silent. And what was really neat about having uh, an AE that had a kind of broader perspective and a sociological background as well um, was to really compel us to bring in a review that went outside of you know, a narrow definition of organizational scholarship to a more broad one. And from there, Prashant executed perfectly in going and putting together and mapping out the realm of what had been done and fitting those papers um, into the structure that we had for the three types of machine learning models. So yeah, there was an awful lot of work in that review piece, but I think that was also helpful for situating what's there and also kind of grounding us a bit so we weren't just sort of, you know, off in left field writing about the possibilities of machine learning. Actually, I'm so glad you said that because I had completely blocked out. The AE actually suggested some of the first exemplars and seeded the idea of, well, what else is there? And then going on that review. So, yes. Yeah. So that's, I mean, uh, one of the big sort of lessons in doing a lot of these interviews is the valuable role that an AE and even reviewers can play in sort of helping papers find their voice and find their audience. And I do. I mean, I think that with the review that you've done and the way the paper's written, if people didn't know your background, they wouldn't know that it had been essentially written by people who are primarily micro um, scholars. It really does seem to stretch far and wide. And so, and 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 I think that's that's sort of part of what we're looking for at AMR is you know let's let's try and make bold claims, let's try and come out with big ideas, and this paper certainly does that. So I'm glad that it's Heather Haveman, I think, uh, was the AE. I think you you acknowledge her in the paper. Um, and so I'm glad she pushed you to to do that. That's really cool. Um, what, uh, what was the toughest element of the paper to eke out or to feel like you get got right or to um, the sort of any, any kind of barriers or hurdles or things you bumped up against? Keith, you've already alluded to trying to put too much into the paper and getting it down to a reasonable type of AMR paper. Are there any other either pieces of the paper or um, uh, uh, aspects of the project that that you bumped up against sort of hurdles? And then what did you do to, to overcome those? Uh, I'll mention two small ones off the top of my head unless... So the first is, I think, tone. And we just talked about the review process. I won't go into detail, but we got some of the harshest reviewer comments I've ever gotten. They were fair, but man, they were harsh about the tone we were taking. And we've mentioned this before, that we really switched to a more how can the two be complementary? That wasn't there in the earlier submission. Um, the second is probably the figure. I don't know how many versions of that figure we went through. So I thank you so much for mentioning that it turned out OK, because we spent a lot of time on it. And on that note, it's, it's worth noting that that figure was all Kira, and I don't know how many, I don't know how many sleepless nights were involved in making that happen because it, we iterated, we thought of ways to take a lot of things and put them into one kind of unifying place, and that is far from my skill set. And just what we went through in, in getting that to something that's cogent and readable and kind of ties us all together, um, I was really, really impressed by by Kira's ability to put that into something concise. So. Yeah, there's not enough credit has been given on that, but um, yeah, getting to that figure was was a bigger hurdle than you would think. Okay. I, I can I can totally appreciate it. Just to make the point that the figure essentially has um, four different dimensions, each but but one plane. So on one dimension, you've got research application, the uh, machine learning and 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 research application, deductive, abductive, inductive. Um, a machine learning category, supervised, reinforced, or unsupervised types of uh, machine learning phenomena, um, well understood or undisclosed sort of unclear phenomena on, on another one, and uh, tolerance for surprise results, high or low. And so you then incorporate all of those things and, and land up with sort of different types of, of or different categorizations of theory or purposes of theory, um, different types of theory. 
And so it really is a very u- unifying figure in many respects. And I'm not surprised it took a lot of time, but I think there's a lot of value embedded in that. So well done for pushing through, Kira. That's that's really good work. <laughs> All of us. If you want one more fun anecdote, yeah. Um, the the printing process, the Chihuahua muffin figure ended up being extremely difficult because we couldn't use other people's pictures. And so we we kept talking about just dropping it and then finally found four publicly available. We I suppose that the, the lesson there is, you know, details matter. And we really wanted it in there as the explanation for what these mechanisms are. But that took longer than we expected. <laughs> So the backstory there is in the paper they've got they've got, they illustrate the sort of machine learning process by distinguishing between a chihuahua and a muffin and okay. um show the pictures through which that would be done and do give full um copyright sort of credits to wikipedia and so on in the picture um uh, uh, sort of footnotes so that's a little bit of backstory there and 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 I think it is illustrative that if you are going to try and use photographs or other people's pictures in your published work, you've got to go through the effort of making sure you've got the appropriate permissions to do that. Um, anything else that came out during the review process? You've already alluded to sort of the value of the the push to make it bigger and sort of bring in other literatures and, if you will, um from from the editor and and some of the, the pushback and um uh, emphasis about sort of positioning from the reviewers um what else sort of changed in the review process and what else did you you gonna as you recall back uh, about that review process yeah you know i i think one thing that we sort of realized or you know an ethos we sort of stuck to is that once you put something out there under review it's really no longer your paper, right? If we're trying to uncover some things that may actually reflect truth in the world, right? Then, then certainly once it's published, it's no longer yours. It's in the public domain. It's our field's decision what to do with it. One step earlier than that, you know, reviewers are smart people um, most of the time, right? And AEs, if you've got the revision, there's something they like there. They like the paper. They see an idea that can be developed. And so this was one of those projects where I think um, we had the right AE where she was very generative and gave us directions and and trade-offs to evaluate as opposed to giving us an exact set of steps to take. Um, But also I think, you know, we, we developed within the team an ethos of, you know, listen to these people, let's go with what they ask us to do. And the paper is way different than I think what any of us had gone into it imagining, but, you know, I'm I'm happy with this co-creation that came out of that process. So, I would say, if anything, the takeaway was an appreciation for the fact that reviewers and AEs um, can help you do, you know, good things if you actually listen to them and are open to it. And I think that co-creation mindset helps um, prevent getting too defensive. Be open to sort of pushing, prompting, even if it's even if it's sometimes conveyed in a harsh tone. Um, it just it just helps with the mindset of getting through the process. So I'm glad you mentioned it. Kira, anything on your part? I mean, even the dialogue, we've mentioned it before, right? But this paper came out and then um, a, and I'm sorry, what is the official term? A rebuttal or a, a, a dialogue? A piece dialogue, was published. yeah. A, di- a dialogue piece was published and then we were given the opportunity to respond to that. And so to be able to continue to have that conversation, um, I think the five-page dialogue that came out of that is actually perhaps even a stronger distillation of the practical guidance we have for our field in terms of theory in the age of machine learning. So all the ideas are in this one. And then the five pager is, so now what? What are what are the implications? So so just to your point, dialogue with the reviewers, with the AE, between the co-authors, with the dialogue, all of it's been helpful. Awesome. Um so you you've had the dialogue, you've had uh you've had the um you've obviously had the paper out there for a while it was published in 2021 and then subsequently had the dialogue out there um what do you hope the long term impact of this paper is like what impact do you hope influence it might have on uh, future theory building on on potentially on 
empirical work, on practice, on policy work? Where, where do you hope it will land in terms of having an impact? And I'd love each of your perspectives on this. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll lead on that. Um, you know, I think empirically, it's it's a good reminder that just like every other machine learning application that comes out or every AI tool that comes out, um, there's good uses and not so good uses. And the technology sometimes um, has so much luster or to appeal to it you know, we can be clumsy about these things and not use them well. And while it's obviously not as dramatic as, you know, uh, Matthew Broderick and War Games sort of scenario where nuclear exchange is going to happen because, you know, org scholars are using machine learning wrong. Mm -hmm. What it really could do, though, is lead to, um, you know, ironically, these tools just left to their own devices, it's hard game, right? Everything we talk about with, you know, the potential of, of hypothesizing after results are known, right? This can be as the... Uh, the commentary on our paper actually put it uh, lead to a dust bowl empiricism. I actually really liked that term in the exchange. So I think reminding people that, yeah, we have a really powerful tool here and there's probably better and worse ways to use it. So I would hope first and foremost, um, there's an empirical angle here and a very practical one to think about what these tools really mean if your goal is to create generalizable theory that explains things in a meaningful way, as opposed to just sort of predicting outcomes. Since Keith talked about the machine learning bit, I think I'll hark on the theory bit again. Thank you for mentioning that it might be of value to PhD students. Um, for me, that's really the important bit. And if I can give a really brief backstory, I thought my career would be in nonprofits. I spent a number of years working in nonprofits. I fell into academia. Still can't believe I'm here. But but so I'm really preoccupied with what is the purpose of our field? And I'm certainly not the only one, right? We're constantly having these conversations. But why does any of this matter? If the taxpayers are paying my salary, why? And so that spectrum of theory and suggesting that there's value in all of it, but it's different value and being much clearer about that when you're designing studies or working on papers about what will that do? Will it advance hyperlocal theory? Will it contribute towards grand theory? And possibly even in our field, having a conversation about that requires different incentives, that requires different timeframes. Can we start having these conversations? Uh, I would be honored if, if it advances those conversations. Yeah. Awesome. So the, um, I, 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 I think this is a foundational paper. I think it will have an impact beyond what we can imagine right now. Um, and who would have predicted that, you know, in a few years' time, AI would be the most prevalent talked about topic in management and br more broadly than that. And so I think you were sort of on the, on the leading edge of that and the front end of that. And I do think that the one additional piece I would like to add into that is the the way the paper takes this balanced perspective, it's not all doom and gloom, but it's also not all happy, smiley faces. It's somewhat optimistic, but it recognizes that there are upsides and downsides. There are opportunities, but we need the right framing mindset perspective to generate those opportunities. And um, and I think from, from a, 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 an exemplar piece, um, in terms of offering that balance and if this, then that, or under these conditions, this is what you might get, or these are the, the possible alternatives. So well done on that regard. I'd love to end off with the final question of having gone through this process now and, 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 and any other prior attempts at theorizing and writing theory, especially this kind of theory where you're sort of theorizing about theorizing or theorizing about generating theory. If someone was to come to you and say, look, I've got a paper that might be in the same sort of genre, I'm trying to target getting into AMR or something equivalent, um, what what could you say you've learned from this process that you might give them a, as advice for the future, either in terms of writing, working with others, review, uh, uh, going through the review process, or any other aspect of the project? project, what have you learned from this project that might be useful for others? Kayla, let's start with you and then we'll go to Keith. I mean, this will apply to this project and any other project, but I really try to approach my projects from an improvisational perspective. So this idea of yes and. And so whether that's reviewer feedback or my co-authors, whatever they're throwing at me, <clears throat> I really try to think, 
wow, okay, how do we build on that? And I think that's particularly important in a theory paper because all you have is laying out your clear ideas, but it could also apply to other papers. Um, in terms of publishing an AMR, you know, it's, it's, it's such a goal, but I, how do I put this? I now have four publications, three of which did not end up at AMR, but were originally submitted to AMR and the review process there, while it didn't in the end end up working out there, really sharpened those ideas and laid the foundation for what those papers ended up becoming. So when people say, you know, I want to publish an AMR, but I'm nervous that if it doesn't hit there, then the manuscript is dead. I haven't found that to be the case. I don't. I hope it's okay to have this conversation at AMR, but so I think AMR actually if you're lucky, it gets in. And worst case scenario, you've gotten some fantastic feedback. Yeah, I mean, I've had the exact same experience that my papers have landed up elsewhere and they've landed up being better elsewhere. And mm -hmm. um, and, and some have even pivoted to become empirical projects and some have gone in mm -hmm. other directions. But um, but I have found that that certainly to be the case. And, and I want to reinforce that point is that if it doesn't get in at AMR, it's not the end of the world. Um, it might land up um, getting in. Uh, I think Keith's landed up at organizational research methods, and we still we still talk about it ten years, twelve years later. The pruning paper. So um, you you never know where it's going to land up. Keith, what about your lessons? Yeah. So yeah, I think I think finding value in the review process, even for papers that don't land at AMR, is is a big one, as you mentioned. Um, I've been through the process at AMR, you know, with some wins and some losses over the years. Um, there's clearly not going to be a boilerplate, right? For a journal that's um, this big tent and is about bringing, um, you know, breadth of new ideas or applying things in new ways. The closest I've come to a metaphor that's been useful to me in thinking about how you go about, um, you know, writing the scope of an AMR paper has been thinking about it almost as a magic trick, right? And so every magic trick has got three parts. First, there's the pledge that something seems ordinary, right? Here's something that exists in the world or exists in our theory that we're already thinking about, right? So in this case, it's, it's machine learning. Uh, and then the turn is you make something disappear, right? Or you make something um, occur that they weren't expecting. You show a shortcoming in the way we're thinking about things or the world may dramatically change and we haven't considered that, right? Um, so for example, if we think about um, the pandemic, nobody would have ever imagined that we'd be living at home wearing masks everywhere you know, hiding out from society and implications. So the turn is really that you make something disappear, that ordinary thing, you just pull the rug out from under people. But it's not enough just to disrupt how people view something, right? Or say, hey, everything we're doing in theory is wrong. You have to bring it back. And you're not going to bring it back in the exact same way. But, you know, what's, what's known as the prestige is with a flourish, you return something to its sort of rightful state of things. So you have to disrupt what's out there. You have to change the way people are thinking about a problem space you have to suggest that X in theory is sort of wrong, but on the other hand, on the back end of it, right, people have to be able to reconcile what you've just done with what they already sort of knew. So, so somewhere in there, I guess, you have to break something in front of them. They have to first you have to let them know that thing is real and it matters. Then you break it, and then you have to restore it, you know, well enough, I think, that they can make sense of it again. So that's what I keep bouncing around in the back of my mind when I when I try to write a theory paper. It doesn't always work. Um but that's what I try to keep as a high level metaphor, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, so, I want to work with him. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I was still an AE at AMR because that would quickly turn into an editorial that would probably um, blow up the world. So great stuff, Keith. That's a that's a, a an awesome metaphor. Well, thank you to both of you. And if you haven't read it, get your hands on it. Ghost in the Machine on Organizational Theory in the Age of Machine Learning. Highly prevalent, highly topical. Highly useful to anyone who just wants to understand theory and theorizing more broadly, but even more specifically, what role our uh, sort of evolving and, and rapidly evolving um, technological tools might play in this. So thank you, Keith. Thank you, Kira. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for doing the series. They're, uh, they're wonderful, and I learn a lot every time. So.